So, how was Project 3? Freaking awesome! Awesome because it's over? <laughs> On the Project 4. Awesome. Uh, cool. Yeah, I'll release those details out today so you can get started on that one. Uh, it actually dovetails in very nicely with what we're talking about today about type systems. So, uh, cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Call break. Go to the housekeeping stuff. All right, let's get back to it. Uh, they are a third of the way of being graded. What's the average so far? I have no idea. I haven't seen it. Uh, no. That would be extra work. So it would be filed under the never going to do category. Uh, do you want to say it's like a high number or a low number? I don't know. Okay. So here we return to example C code that we've been looking at to study memory errors. What are the specific types of memory errors that we looked at on Friday? A dangling reference? Yeah, what does that mean? From somebody else who didn't just say dangling pointer. Yeah? Isn't that when we, when we have a pointer pointing to something and the thing pointing to goes out of scope, so it's pointing to some memory address that could be overwritten, oh. or could, could it also have the same value it had before, theoretically? Yes, so dangling reference in generally means we have a reference, some, one of our pointers has a value in it, and that points to memory that is deallocated. So that deallocation could have happened in two different ways, right? It could be deallocated due to scoping rules, so the memory that it pointed to went out of scope, or the second alternative is the, man, uh, the programmer manually freed and deallocated the memory, but we still contain a reference to that memory. So either way, as soon as that happens, right, we have a dangling reference. It's not that dereferencing it causes the problem, which is a problem, but in itself, it is a dangling reference. Cool. What's the second thing? Segmentation faults, what's caused from what? Dereferencing null pointers. Dereferencing null pointers, which is basically the same thing as uh, dangling reference. What's another type of memory error that happens when your program, let's say, accumulates memory over time? Garbage. Garbage, yes. Right, so what's, what is garbage in relation to memory errors? Memory leak? Yes, what is it? You don't have access to the memory anymore? Please right, so we have memory that is allocated, but we have no way to access that memory, right? There is no series of pointers we can follow to access that memory. And so therefore we say, because that memory can no longer be accessed, we can no longer free that memory, and so it's going to exist forever. Cool. So we have this little program here. Uh, we have an integer pointer called dang in the main method. It gets the result of foo, and foo is returning the address of x, where x is a local variable inside foo. Yeah? Is it considered a memory error if we inadvertently corrupt our data because of aliases? Like, does that fall in that category? If we have some pointers that are aliased and we change it one place and it's magically changing somewhere else and we don't see the connection, is that considered a memory error or is that just being done? I think I would file that under bug. A bug due to aliasing. I don't think there's a specific name. I mean, it'd be like an aliasing problem. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a specific term. And I don't know that I'd necessarily clump that in with all memory errors, like these ones. These ones are very specific, very concrete things where we can say, yes, this is wrong because of this. It may be that you wanted to do that, right? So like the problem is your intentions as the programmer are different than what's actually there. Whereas like a memory error exists in a program and you can say definitively just by looking at the code, yes, there's an error here, or no, there's not. I think that's what I think about it. But don't hold me to that, I don't know. Maybe there's some fancy classification of all these errors. Cool. Okay, so we have foo. Foo is returning an integer pointer. It's returning the address of x, which is an R value. We store that in dang, and then we print out 
the value that's inside Dang and also what Dang points to, right? We dereference Dang and print out whatever it's pointing to. We call var, which has two local variables, y and z, print out y and z, and then print out Dang and Dang star. And we saw on Friday, I'm go through this, because we just want to get to the results. Uh, we saw that when we compiled this, it actually does give us a warning, which is nice. Compilers are pretty smart. Uh, it's telling us that function foo returns the address of a local variable, which we know is a problem because that local variable's address is only valid in the scope of that program. Right? So that by returning that, we're basically essentially guaranteeing that that memory of x is deallocated by the time we use the return value of foo. When we run this, on this specific machine, which was 64-bit, we got some memory address 100. And then we saw 10,000 and zero, which is actually what we expect so far, right? Because here we have, so this would be the address of x, what is inside dang, which is being output right here. And then we have, what does it point to? And it points to 100, which is what we expect. I mean, we expect incorrectly, because you should not be able to do this. Because at this point, dang is a dangling reference, and so there's no guarantees on what that value is going to be when we access it. Inside bar, we see it should be 10,000 and zero, right? Y is 10,000, Z is zero, it prints out Y and Z. 10,000, zero makes sense. But then when we return, we see that things have changed, right? So how come dang did not change? This first output. Because it's still, it's still pointing at that memory address, it's not going to go anywhere. Right, so where is dang allocated? What type of allocation? Stack. It's allocated on the stack. In on the stack, at some memory address that we don't know, we can just call it the address of Dang right now. Has the value seven ff e three e six eighty ffc, which was the address of x, right? And because these function calls don't change the value inside Dang inside this variable, right? It's clear that it should not change anything. But we see that. Maybe surprisingly, maybe not. What Dang points to changes. Cool. And we'll see that this is not consistent across different implementation, different programming, like uh, sorry, a different operating systems. So this is on CentOS 6.7. Here is on the Mac. So compiling it also has a warning, which is nice. And then when we run it, we see obviously a different address. Makes sense. Prints out 100. Same thing. Prints out 10,000, zero. Prints out the same thing in 10,000. Right, so we can see that actually in this case, dang, what was the address of x is now probably the address of y, right, in this call to bar. But we can't guarantee that that's going to remain the same. Cool. These can also be very tricky to debug and figure out what's going on. Because here you just have something that you're pointing to and it's just changing randomly throughout the program. Cool. Questions here? Alright. Cool. Let's go through another example. So here we have two variables, dang and foo, inside main. Uh, dang and foo are both integer pointers. We're saying dang is equal to malloc size of int. So what's malloc going to do for us? going to give us a new memory location, right? It's going to give us a new box. And what does malloc return? <coughs> what specific R value? The address of the new box, exactly. Right? So it creates a new box, it returns an address of that box, and then we store that into dang. Is, anything, is everything good so far? And we say foo equals dang, also good. We so star foo is equal to 100. Is that valid? Cool. Then we free foo, is that also valid? Cool. So, so we have, let's see, let's do box circle here because I think it's going to help. So we got to here, let's say right here, right? So we have dang, we have foo, box 
is attached. Circles. So on this line, this creates a new box, which I don't have enough room, so I'm going to draw here. Uh, I don't have an address. Let's call it alpha. All right, perfect. So malloc size of the int gives us four bytes, or eight bytes, depending on what system we're on. And it returns alpha, puts it into dang. Then here we say foo is equal to dang, so we copy the value inside dang and copy it into the location associated with foo. So it's going to put alpha here. So now when I say star, what is star foo in this diagram? Alpha value. This is so cool. Very close. So what does star always return? A location, an L value. Dereferences always return a location. So when I dereference it, I'm actually talking about this box. Foo. So I set that equal to 100. And then I create foo, and then what happens? How's my diagram change? Delete which box? The foo, this box? The new one. So then, what does star foo point to now? Nothing, yes. Perfect. So then at this point here, what dangling references do we have? Foo and dang, right? Exactly. So here when I try to print out dang, the problem is, even though I freed foo, because dang still had this address in it, star dang is now dangling. Like dang is a dangling pointer at this point, a dangling reference. Cool, so it's going to output something. Then I say foo is equal to int star size of int. So this is going to malloc create me a new, let's call it beta here. So it's going to copy beta into here. Now when I say star foo is equal to 42, what's it going to change? Yeah, inside this new box. And then I free foo. <coughs> goes away, and then I print out star dang. What do you think it's going to output? What can it output semantics wise? Anything. Why anything? Something else might have taken over that memory. Yeah, we're pointing to memory that has been deallocated, right? Dang is a dangling reference, so dereferencing it now means it could literally be anything in there, right? The semantics make absolutely no guarantee about what that value is. So let's see. Cool. Okay, blah, 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 all the way through here. So running this on CentOS 6.7, and unlike before, we compile this with all warnings enabled, and we get nothing. Right? Nothing to tell us that we're doing something wrong. So when I run it, one time when I did it, it output zero and zero. Is that what you expected or not what you expected? No. Huh? No. Not what you expected? Well, I expected to be the same. You expect it to maybe be the same, like a hundred every time? Let's try it on a different operating system. So running this on the Mac. You can compile it again, no warnings, right? This is very tricky behavior because of the aliases. It comes back to the aliases, right? We're freeing foo, that automatically means that dang is now a dangling pointer. And now when I run it, I get 100 on the first output, which is kind of what we expect. But then the next time, I get 42. So why do you think that is? Same was allocated again. What was that? Yeah, so instead of, when we talk about it symbolically, right, we said malloc returns some new address, which is some box that is a brand new box, which is the case kind of abstractly. But what actually happens here is malloc, when you call free, it's free to reuse that memory location. So the next time here you ask for, hey, give me four bytes, it says, great, here, I got four bytes, here's alpha. And so by changing that value in there, we're changing the same memory location. 
Cool. Questions here? I thought this was kind of cool. Yeah. So can we say that the free function does the thing for it? Like it doesn't change the value for map for this compiler and maybe stand to it? Ah, so the free and malloc are libc functions. So it actually doesn't have anything to do with the compiler itself. It depends on the library. So yeah, it could be the different library versions. Some library versions could zero things out when they free it, but uh, you know you want to run fast. So you and by the C standard, you don't have to do that, right? So you're just doing extra work, and your malloc and free is going to be slower than somebody else's who doesn't do that. I mean, it may make sense for small things. If you think about, it, you could malloc a huge chunk of data, right, in the gigs range, and it will work and do that. So if you have to free that, or zero that whole thing out, you may be wasting time right now. Uh, are you guaranteed a segmentation fault if you try to write to a data pointer? Ooh, are you guaranteed a segmentation fault? No. So if we chose to, here I'm essentially accessing so you're reading. the data pointer. I'm reading. I could also write to it the same way it would work. Because that memory uh, segmentation fault has to do with Beyond. the operating system says, tells your program, hey, these memory segments you can use, and you're trying to access something that's outside of those segments. Here, you're accessing something that your program has been allowed to access. It's inside the segment, in the heap segment specifically. But because, um, so there's no error when you read or write to that. Segmentation fault is reading or writing. Yeah. So if you write to a dangling pointer, is it still a dangling pointer? And yet now you know what it is and you know where it is. It is still dangling because you shouldn't have access to that memory, right? You are changing memory that has not been allocated to your program. That's tricky. You want to try real quick? Let's try real quick. Well, just the worry is that at any point, it could get written over. You're never yes. guaranteed what if you put something there. It's yeah, you could write to it and then immediately read from it, and you have no guarantee that it's going to be the same value you just put there. I see. Mm -hmm. All right. Temp. Uh, what are we? All right. We want to start writing to it. Somebody shout out a number. Three, seven. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see, I want to see food too. I want to see what values it returns. This could be interesting. Okay, so we can see here, so the first output of the printf is the first thing that malloc returns, right? So this is some memory address on the heap, 7F8690C05390, whatever. Um, then we output 100, we're outputting what dangle points to. Then we change it to three right in the next line. Even though it's dangling, we're still just writing to memory that we have read-write access to. So this works, and it outputs three. Then we call malloc again, and we can see we actually get back that same memory address because we called free. What? And then we can set dang to be 53, and it outputs 53 even after we freed it. Pretty cool. Questions? Yeah. So if we output Which one? Where? Here? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yep. Right, which makes 
sense because they're both pointing to that same memory location. Yeah. Can you throw another valid in there? Just sure. throwing an assignment to something so we can see if it, because it gave you back the same one, right? Yes. So we can do maybe this one to do simulate two of the Don't assign it to foo. Before? So now we can see that the memory address changed. Here it's 9400030, and here it's 00020. And now we can see they're not pointing to the same thing anymore because we've essentially malloc more memory. Uh, let's see, if we're really tricky. What's the difference between those? Can somebody do hex max very quickly? It's an eight and nine. Uh, yeah. What is that? 16? Yeah, 16. So we could do something very not good. We could. I think it's see how the sausage is made. This seems to be all prepared for me. Cool. Any questions on this? Any pointers? Garbage? Cool. Another example. Okay. So I believe this is from one of the practice midterms or something. Let's see. Okay. So we have a program, we have an int main, we have a global variable Q, a local variable A, a scope here, we have an int pointer B, we see A is equal to malloc size of int, and what does this memory one say of mean over here? We're just labeling the box. Yeah, we're just like giving the box an address. We're saying it's returning memory location one, so that's what we can use. So, how many boxes do I have already before I get to that point, when I'm right here? Three. Three boxes. I have Q first. That's not a Q. I got, have an A. And I have a B. Then when I get to this line, I see a malloc, and it's telling
telling me that its memory is address 1. So I know I have some new box here, memory address 1. Do I know what's inside that box? No. Nope, no idea. But the return of that is stored where? A. A. So it's 1 inside of A. I then execute this next line where I'm doing the same thing. I'm malloc a new memory location, 2. And I'm storing that inside the location associated with B. Then I set star A to be 42. So how's that going to change my diagram? The value inside memory 1 is going to be 42. So some of the things I should be able to do is at these various program points, draw the box circle diagrams at that point. Right? And I can even draw star A and star B. Label those lines as well. Is that required? Possibly, it depends on what the question says. Then, after this next line, I say b is equal to int star malloc size of int memory 3. So now I have a new. And so, what do I do? How else does this diagram change? So, I just called malloc, I created a new location. What else do I do? Yeah. Put it into b. Yeah. Put it into b. And then I say star B is equal to star A. So what's star A? 42. 42, this location. And so I'm copying the value associated with this location into where? 3. So this is star B. And I'm copying 42 into there. Then I say Q is equal to the address of A. Let's say we didn't give these things addresses. We'll just call this address of A, address of Q, address of B. I think uh, it'll usually be here in a comment. So how does this Q is equal to the address of A? Cool. Okay. So now we get to program point Q, 2, sorry. So what memory is garbage at point 2? 2, two. memory location 2. What are the aliases at program point 2? Star, star Q. And star A. Q star and A. So what's... So what's star Q? Points to here. And A also refers to that same box. So at point 2, star Q and A, these are both aliases. What else? I heard somebody say star A and star B. Are those aliases? No. Why not? Right, they don't. Aliases are references, different names for the same box. And here, star A points to one box, star B points to another. Even though they have the same value, they are different locations. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Now we get to point three. How does the diagram change? Does it say the same? is an R value. It can't be an alias, right? 
Uh, what definitely does not count, I guess we should get this clear, although I've never had this come up, but you can't do like star address of A and A. <laughs> right, that doesn't count. You're just adding a visual structure. It would be clever, but at this point, since I just warned you. Cool, so program point three, what memory is garbage? To N3, right? So the way to think about it is you can say starting from the variables that I know, is there any way I can follow their pointers? What memory can I access? Right? So starting from Q, I can follow Q and then follow A to get here. Starting from A, I can start here and follow here, but there's no way I can get to and access two and three. Right? It's impossible. So two and three are both garbage because at this program point three, B went out of scope. So what about dangling references? Do I have any dangling references? No. Do I have the aliases are the same, right? Star Q and A, star star Q and star A. Let's see, is there any point in going on? No, there's no more code. Memory three is still in scope. It is, it was, memory three was manually allocated on the heap by the programmer. So it has to be manually deallocated with the call to the three function. But because B is on the stack, as soon as we leave its scope, it is automatically deallocated. Right, the same as A, when we return from main, A will be gone. Q will remain forever. Cool. All right. So we talked about various types of semantics, right? We talked about assignment semantics. So what are the semantics of when we see A equals B? Copy the value in the location associated with B to the value in the location associated with A. Is this true in every single programming language you've ever used? No? Which is it not true in? What was that? Semantics wise, that's a syntax issue. You would tell me I had zero Pascal knowledge. Except maybe for that one fact. So, what about? I did something like Semantics-wise, what should happen here? I'm referencing the same object. Referencing the same object, but I don't have pointers in Java. It's just a syntactic thing. They all essentially. 
key pointers or references? Who is the syntactic thing? You want to argue that a little bit more? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just already references. You don't have to declare them as pointers. It's just okay. how it works. But then what if I change this? Well, it's going to mess it up. But let's consider a very similar example. Those are primitives, not objects. So? Make it, make it capital integer. Put the object wrapper with the primitive around it. There you go. <laughs> this doesn't really work, right? But we can say who. So it outputted 42. What if you output Bob? Oh, no. So, okay, so to make it even more confusing, right? This actually follows our assignment semantics that we talked about, right? It's essentially copying this value, 42, right? It's copying it into bar, and they are both separate locations, right, that store values inside them. Whereas, even though we probably are not gonna go through it and do this, if we see this, what would this output, assuming object has some baz field? Should output another test, right? But that means then that the copy semantics are different. Not only just different than this case, they're different than what we normally think about when we think about copy semantics, right? This copy semantics, if this assignment semantics, if we were using Copy semantics like we talked about, right? It would be copy the object foo into the object var, right? Get a brand new copy of that object, and then changes to one object, like here, here we're changing var, should then change baz. Cool. And then Java, of course, confuses things because 
not everything is a class. Some things are classes and some things are primitives and some things are class primitives and just to make it even more annoying and weird. And some data types are uh, immutable. Whereas like actually if you want to uh, really explore object-oriented programming, I suggest you check out Ruby. Literally everything is an object in Ruby. Like even numbers. Like numbers have a method, uh, something like You basically, the syntax of this isn't right. But you have, like, every integer has a method called up to, which does a loop. And we'll go starting from one up to whatever parameter you want and execute a chunk of code for every time. So it's like a custom for loop built into every integer. Um, and they have other things too that, so it's just kind of nice because it strips away and says, okay, let's not deal with this nonsense that Java has where you have sometimes objects, sometimes classes, sometimes integers and primitives. Like, let's treat everything as a class. Okay, so what does Java actually do? So when we see this bar equals foo, what's it doing? And does this completely change? Do we have to change the way we draw our diagrams or think about box circle diagrams and all that? It checks the data type on the edges and arches of the assigned operator. And does what? What, so in this case of the objects, what is it doing here? So, kind of like pointer thing. Yeah, so there's actually two ways to think about this. One way is to think about now that you know and understand pointers deeply, you can think about what is Java doing under the hood, right? Under the hood, foo and bar are pointers. And when every time you access any field of foo or bar or pass it into a function, you're passing in a pointer to that object. Another way to think about it, which works the same, is to change the way we think about pointer semantics. And to, or sorry, not pointer semantics, assignment semantics. So here, here when I see I have an object foo, right, normally I say I have foo, that means it has a location associated with it. Here, when I have an object foo, I just have a name foo. And when I see it's equal to a new object, this new object actually creates the new location. And the assignment operator in this case does the binding. And this says bind the name foo to that object. And then here when we see object bar, we just have a name bar, but no location associated with bar. Until here this changes foo baz to test. We'll just put test in here, kind of. And now when we say bar equals to foo, now the assignment semantics do not mean copy. It means bind the name bar to something different. Bind the name bar to the same thing that foo's bound to. And so it's bound like this. So you can see it kind of two different ways, depending on how you, whatever's easiest or best for you to think about the semantics of Java. But it definitely works uh, like it does work this way. Uh, it's called sharing semantics. So you're saying that A and B, you're basically allowing your semantics to say that the assignment operator rebinds names to locations rather than copies things around. Cool. Oh yeah, so we have cool stuff. So we have like A, B. We can say A is a new object. We're going to create a new object, bind it to A. We can say B is a new object. We can say A is now a new object. And finally, assign B to A. And so now we can know exactly what happens when we manipulate objects that are associated with either A or B. Cool. Questions on this? Yes? So then, so that if you change something in B, it also change, change the value in A. Exactly. Which is what we're used to in Java, right? If you want a copy of an object, you need to specifically clone that object to get a brand new object. But in this case, will it clone it, or will it just point to the point is, in A? Essentially, they are referring to the same object, A and B. So any changes to A will be reflected when you access B. Okay. Yeah. Will you ever ask us, like, pass by reference? Like, say, pass by reference, and you know that's. We're going to get that. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do, I guess we can. Where am I? That's going to be when we get to the runtime environment. So we need to go a little bit more. 
I like to do more in depth into the runtime environment so we can talk about exactly what the stack looks like, where the compiler puts things in memories, and then that gets into how parameters are passed and all those kinds of things. So we'll learn about um, pass by value, pass by reference, pass by name, and different ways that the compiler can actually do those. Uh, so for now, we're going to talk about type systems. Oh, let me, I'm going to kill, yeah, I'll just tag on you. We're going to switch to type systems. So how are type systems and semantics related? What's a type system? What is a type system? Good question. How an operator works could change depending upon the type. How an operator works could change. Yeah, so the built-in operators may change depending on their types. In some languages, plus operator, if its arguments are integers, it will do addition. If its arguments are strings, it will do string concatenation. There's some languages that are super annoying where you have to use a different operator. Plus is only defined for integers, so if you want to add floats or something, you have to use a different operator, which makes it incredibly annoying to program those. So what else, what are type systems used for? Are they good, useful? Do you wish? You've never had a type system and didn't have to worry about it, or do you love it? Strongly typed languages are safer. Safer how? Less likely to make your computer explode in your face. Have you ever had your computer explode in your face? <laughs> well, Maybe if you have a Galaxy Note 7. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Java running on that phone. Don't tell myself. So do you like it or not like it? I mean, I think that's a fundamental question. Yeah. I personally like it. And uh, one nice thing about static typing and struct typing is that you can do a lot of uh, like refactoring to developer tools that can't do with many types. Yeah, so there's, uh, there definitely is a lot of benefit. So, OK, so we're talking about type systems. So the idea is if every variable has a type and every function knows what types of parameters it takes, you can actually do pretty cool things and you can say, like, in this method, change this uh, variable to a different type or change the type of my functions to change types and do all kinds of cool refactoring. I think you can do cool things like in Java, some of the fancy stuff, you can just highlight some part of your code and say refactor this into its own method and it will automatically figure out inputs and outputs depending on what things are using things. Yeah. What about safety? So what, what is a type system? So does it help you be more expressive? Does it restrict what you're trying to do? Keeps it from doing things that are allowed but are unexpected. Keeps it from, keeps your program, keeps you from writing programs, right, that do weird or unexpected things. Right, so semantics, right? Semantics is about very precisely defining exactly what everything in the programming language means, right? Here with type systems, now we're saying, okay, we know what the program does, but what types of things are allowable, right? This actually, I think of it as restrictive, right? The type system tries to stop you, the programmer, from doing things that could end up harming yourself like trying to add a string to a number, right? Which doesn't make any sense. Or like Python, you can multiply a string and a number, which actually is handy, but also makes no sense. It, it repeats that number that many times. So like what happens if you have negative numbers? See, it doesn't make sense, right? It's just weird programming shortcuts. So I can see that, that what are the drawbacks? You guys have just been praising strongly typed languages. It's what? Slow to write. Slow to write? Why? You have to type and it's uh, that's yeah, So you actually have to, an if you think about it, you're annotating, right? The computer doesn't necessarily need to know the types of all the variables, but you're having to tell the computer exactly what every variable in your program, what you think the types of that variable should be, right? So you're literally typing more. What else? Yeah. I think strong typing would help memory management, but in what uh, sense? Sure. So if you know the type of something, you know how much space to allocate it, and it'll never need more space than that. But if an object can 
randomly change types, if you have a variable that in an instant changes from an integer to a string, you're going to have to figure out how to allocate more space for it. Yeah, there's actually performance, there can be performance benefits. What about when you're writing? Do you ever write a bunch of code and it gives you very cryptic type warnings and type errors? Casting like, always works. It's casting. <laughs> yes, casting is the way that you can intentionally trick yourself up and say, no, no, I definitely know what I'm doing here. And then it turns out five hours later you didn't. So you have to go back and take that out and fix it. Um, yeah, so there's pros and cons. And I want you to think about that. 